Welcome to the fourth lecture on quantum computing. Today we'll look into vector spaces and some linear algebra that is required uh, to prepare these algorithms that we intend to run on quantum computers and to understand more about the fundamentals of quantum computing. Uh, let's look at some basic properties and uh, the Dirac notation again. In quantum computing, integers from 0 to n are associated with n plus 1 orthogonal unit vectors in a vector space of d equals n plus 1 dimensions over the complex numbers. So that means if we have um, two-dimensional qubit space, uh, you remember um, these are the states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. 1, 1. So what this means is that we have four-dimensional qubit space. So if you remember, um, 0, 0 given by 1, 0, 0, 0, and uh, 0, 1 given by 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. Um, this means we have four-dimensional two-qubit space here and they are orthogonal. Orthogonal in that case means that you only see one one in each of these vectors. Um, so if, if we go in terms of coordinate systems and directions, so if you look at this cartoon on the bottom right here, then you can um, see clearly what I mean. So if we go the direction AB here uh, and compare it to the direction CD, and you can clearly see these are orthogonal to each other. Um, usually the dimension d is a power of 2, so that means in terms of two-dimensional qubit space, um, two-dimensional qubit space, so each qubit can represent two states. And let's say I have two qubits, then it's 2 to the power of 2 equals four possible states. Um, if I have three qubits, then still each of these qubits can represent two states, it's 2 to the power of 3 equals 8. Um, so that also shows um, that um, anytime you add a qubit to a quantum computer, if it's a perfect quantum computer, then you double the computational power of this system. This is not true for any classical computer. Um, orthonormal vectors may be denoted by, uh, for example, phi sub 1, phi sub 2, 3, n, and um, orthonormality, in that case, just summarizes these two conditions where we have vectors that need to be orthogonal to each other and they need to have unit length and preserve unit length when we execute transformations, which is guaranteed because we only execute uh, unitary transformations, if you remember from last lecture. Um, <coughs> All right, let's continue here. Um, we had that a unit vector in a normed vector space is a vector of length one. So for example, a direction vector representing a spatial direction. If you remember um, the simplest case uh, where we have state zero and state one um, with these two vectors, right? So I have one zero and 0, 1 here, and that generalizes, as we just saw in the last slide, to multiple qubits, of course. The inner product uh, of this vector with itself is 1. So if we look at that for a moment, let's take the simple example um, with 0 and 1 again. So let's um, do the inner product, 0, 0 equals 1, 0, 1, 0. Clearly, that is 1. 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0. If I look at um, 0 and 1 here, in that case, I would again have 1, 0 times 0, 1 equals 0. So this is how you can check. Um, the orthonormality condition of basis set, okay?
Unit vectors may be used to represent the axes of our Cartesian coordinate systems. So this is another example that we have here with the x, y, and z axis of a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system here. And um, any linear combination of these three uh, can be used to express any point in that coordinate system. And again, here too, orthogonality and normalization conditions are met and expressed by the inner products, as we just saw before. So anytime your vector uh, is not itself, the result will be steer zero. And uh, anytime the vector, uh, you take the inner product of a vector with itself, then it will give you one if these uh, conditions are met. The indices describing integers associated with vectors are far too important in quantum computing. So therefore, if we have um, a uh, vector x or a vector y, y, then we take this usually as a name. So another example that we had before already, again, is 0 and 1. And of course, if you feel more comfortable, you can give this any name, but the usual convention is um, we use something um, that uh, lets us refer back to the state, so to the basis state vector um, that it refers to. So if we look at this example here, so when we have the description in the brackets, um, then it's a lot easier to read than this one here where you have a subscript. Okay, so the vectorial uh, character is preserved by these brackets with the bracket notation that we already talked about before. And very generic vectors in quantum computing are these two. So very often you will see um, that you start in some state, psi, and then you do some evolution here and end up in the state phi. A vector space describing the operation of um, a quantum computer consists of all linear combinations of phi um, of the n plus 1 orthonormal vectors. So, and this means if we look at that example here on the bottom here, we have the vector uh, psi. Uh, sorry, I said phi before. We have the vector psi and we have the probability amplitudes alpha sub zero, alpha sub one associated with each of these states. So alpha sub zero with zero, alpha sub one with one, and alpha sub n with the nth state. And uh, here uh, we start with zero, and if we sum that up, um, that gives you the combined state, um, okay? And uh, we remember that our probability amplitudes are complex numbers. Um, before uh, we wrote down a plus b i, but this is um, what I mean here. So there are complex numbers, or u and v in that case, or a and b in the other case are real numbers, and i equals the square root of minus 1, or i squared is minus 1. Okay. Um, one other example um, in... Uh, terms of notation is very important here. So you see uh, here is everything in one bracket um, and here you have the probability amplitudes um, with separate states and, and um, brackets. So this is exactly the same. We will write it this way usually in this lecture. Now let's look at a linear combination more closely. Uh, so let's suppose that you have a field K for example, the real numbers, and then you have a vector space V over K. Then we call all the elements of V vectors and call the elements of K scalars. And if V sub 1 and V sub n are vectors and A sub 1 and A sub n are scalars, then the linear combination of these vectors with those scalars as coefficients is given by uh, what we just saw before, a sub 1, V sub 1, um, and uh, plus A sub 2, V sub 2, and so on, A sub N, V sub N. And um, here we have another example. So if we look at uh, 
the state and remember the vectors from the Cartesian coordinate system. So if we have this vector here, then it's equal to, um, let's look at this first amplitude here, a sub 1, 0, 0, 0, a sub 2, 0, plus 0, 0, a sub 3. Why is that? Because we're using the basis vectors and uh, if we just pull the a's out, our amplitudes here, and uh, use the basis vectors only, then it um, becomes more clear. So we have a sub 1 times 1, 0, 0, a sub 2 times 0, 1, 0, and a sub 3 times 0, 0, 1. Okay, and sometimes this set of vectors, um, in that case, um, we can call them E1, sorry, we can call them E1, E2, E3, this set of vectors um, is then the same as A sub 1, E1, A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 2 plus A sub 3, E sub 3. Okay, so these are uh, different ways of writing down the same thing. And the linear combination, as I said before, uh, means that any coordinate, any point um, can be in that coordinate system can be expressed uh, by uh, adding up or combining the basis vectors plus the respective scalars. In a vector space over complex numbers, um, the inner product of two general vectors is a complex number satisfying this one here. So what you can see here is the inner product of, so in bra, you remember that's the row vector here, and a ket, um, you have um, the column vector here. And what you see here on the right it's um, exactly the same as if you take the complex conjugate of both. And uh, you remember the complex conjugate um, of a complex number is just switching the sign here. So this is identical or as um, u and v are real. And the inner product is linear in the right hand vector. So you can clearly see what that means. So if we take our um, state uh, phi here and um, we combine it with another state alpha psi 1 plus beta psi 2 then what that means is my phi goes in here and uh, my alpha comes out so the probability amplitude is now valid for this state here for this one and same here for beta and it's anti-linear in the left hand vector which is um, basically the same idea behind all that. Um, so we take the state psi in that case, bring that into phi 1 and phi sub 2. And um, what happens then, since we're dealing with um, the bra vector here, um, if we pull the amplitudes out, we get the complex or have to use the complex conjugate, which is the same for the whole state. Okay. Now, orthonormality dictates that the inner product of a vector psi with another vector, um, oh, I don't have that here, with another vector uh, phi in that case. Uh, so you can imagine uh, that being um, a vector given by alpha 1, 0, 1 plus alpha 2 1 and so on until alpha n n so um, if you combine these two then the inner product is given in terms of the expansion coefficients alpha and beta so the amplitudes um, specifically in quantum computing and uh, remember when you do the inner product, so with this vector here with uh, phi, then our amplitudes here are alpha 1 to alpha n. But now since we take the bra here, we uh, think about the complex conjugate again, so and take that one. And the squared magnitude of a vector is the inner product with itself. So the letter equation gives for squared magnitude um, this one here.
okay uh, yeah and we already had that one so no need to discuss this in more detail but one thing um, that we will discuss um, is how to construct um, operators so we'll also look into that in more detail later on but i'll show you one example right here so if we um, look at that one again so where we have our probability amplitudes here um, and uh, so square them then this confirms that a linear transformation a which is a matrix associates with every vector another vector called this one a um, I remember before that we gave it psi prime subject to the to the rule um, for example if we take this a um, and apply it to that state here then of course it is the same as applying this a singly to each of these states here so, um, let's look at an operator phi psi acting on a cat chi so then um, you can write it um, that way here or written that way which is by linear combination the same and uh, if we look at one example so when I show you how to construct one of these operators uh, let's say we want to construct the identity matrix so you remember the identity matrix which is given by this one here just to verify is it the identity matrix 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 equals 1 and 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0 is 0 okay so applied to the state 0 it returns the state 0 so this is the identity matrix but how do you get to these operators um, so one way to do that is to deconstruct them um, into the possible state and effects so what does it do to the state zero? So what we want to start with is the bra of the state zero. This is what we want to get in the end. This is not what we start with. This is what we want to end up with. Okay, so the final result should be zero. And now let's look at one example where we start with the state zero. So if we write that out, then we look at 1, 0 times 1, 0, okay? And if we bring that into matrix form, so just execute that operation here, we have 1 times 1, 1 times 0, 0 times 1, 0 times 0. Now, if we look at the same result um, with 1, because that's what the identity matrix does, it leaves the state 1, um, as the state 1, so it doesn't change it. But here we do the same. So we say 0 times, or 0, 1 times 0, 1, and we will end up with this matrix here. But how do we get to the identity matrix now? So we have these two, these are the only two uh, operations for one qubit state that the identity matrix does. So what we have to do is sum them up, okay, plus which is, by the way, one way of executing an identity matrix, um, but we'll look at that in a bit, um, which is also equal to 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0, 1 equals, voila, we have the identity matrix. So now let's look at this one more closely. So let's again start with 0 plus 1. Oh, I made a mistake up here, sorry. This was, of course, meant to be 1. Um, and here, 1. That equals 
uh, not equals, we want to do an operation more specifically. So we apply that to the state one in that case. So now remember one crucial thing. We look at um, the inner products again. So we remember if we take the inner product of a vector with itself, it will result in one. If we take the inner product of an orthogonal basis, so in an orthogonal, uh, if in, a, in a set of orthogonal basis vectors, if we take um, two vectors out and do the inner product and they're not the same, then this will result in zero. And so let's execute this here. So we say in that case, zero, zero. And now we take the one plus one okay and uh, if we look at that now so if we execute that one here um, since they're not the same this will be zero and now if we look at that one here since they are the same this will be one and now what remains is of course uh, 0 times 0, so the state 0 times 0 leaves us with nothing. And uh, the state 1 times 1 leaves us with 1. So now you saw one way of executing the transformations. Actually, another way. We did the matrix version before. But what we did here now shows you how you can use the bracket notation easily to construct operators and also to execute transformations uh, without the need of writing down the whole matrix and vector um, notation. Okay, so now let's go back to our lecture here. <clears throat> Just to uh, remind you again, a unitary transformation preserves the magnitudes of all vectors and um, from linearity, it follows that all magnitudes are preserved if unit vectors are taken into unit vectors. Uh, we also remember that a unit vector is a vector of magnitude 1, and uh, it must not only preserve the inner products of arbitrary vectors with themselves, but also the inner products of arbitrary pairs of vectors, which is the linearity that we saw before. And one can associate with any vector psi um, the linear functional that takes psi into the number uh, bra phi ket psi. Okay, so usually um, I'm a little sloppy when reading these things, um, but this one you usually read as ket psi, and this one you would read as bra, bra phi. So the set of all linear functional forms a vector space itself. Um, the dual space of the original space. And we already had a look at that before, the functional associated with the vector um, alpha phi plus beta phi, uh, beta psi is a sum of um, complex conjugate of the alpha amplitude in that case, so alpha star here, alpha, times the functional associated with beta and beta star, so the complex conjugate times the functional associated with psi here. Okay, and any linear functional original space is associated with a vector in dual space, which just means if there is a ket, there is also a bra. Very easy. Um, to sum this up, um, in the space of uh, real numbers, if vectors are represented as column vectors, then linear functionals are represented as row vectors. And their action on these vectors is given by the dot product or the matrix product with the row vector on the left and the column vector on the right, which was just what we looked at before. <clears throat> uh, here's more formalism um, for you to go over. But um, we don't need that for now. So uh, we just keep in mind the cat is the vector in the original space and the bra is the vector in dual space. Uh, 
And uh, if we think about the amplitudes, then the complex conjugate is the amplitude in dual space. Uh, can also be, so this one here can equally be viewed as the inner product of the kets um, phi and psi. And a dual vector space is, to a real vector space, the space of linear functions. So in the dual of a complex vector space, the linear functions take complex values. And a very basic example here is the n-dimensional Euclidean space. Each element uh, here is represented by a list of real numbers, scalars, a real numbers addition is component-wise, and scalar multiplication is multiplication on each term separately, which is not big news, I guess. Um, let's look at one uh, specific example. Um, it's not very practical, but uh, it's something that is very helpful, in my opinion. So, as we remember, in quantum physics, um, the absolute measurement values are represented or replaced by probabilities. So, what you see here is an example uh, of throwing through dices or the possible outcomes of throwing through dice, two dices, right? So, if you have um, two dice... If you have two dice, um, then uh, the minimum outcome that you can get by throwing two ones is two. The maximum by throwing two sixes is 12. And uh, now if we look at the possible number of combinations, so how with how many different combinations can you get two? So because you only have two ones, there is only one combination. Um, and if we look at it more specifically or more closely, so then we see that the number 7 is given by most of the possible combination of these two. So for example, it's given by a 6 and a 1, it's given by 5 and a 2, and so on. Now, if we look at uh, what that means in terms of probabilities, then here on the left-hand side, you see the probabilities of throwing uh, each outcome. Since we only have one possible combination, so one way of throwing two ones, um, so meaning the number two, the probability is one over 36. Um, and here uh, we go on until six over 36, okay? Because of the number of possible <coughs> ways of, of how you can throw the number seven. And if we talk about probability amplitudes now, then here on the right, um, which means we take the square root of p. Remember the probability amplitudes in quantum computing, you need to square them to get the real probability. So in order to prepare these probability amplitudes here, we now take the square root of p. So that means um, here for the first one, 1 over 36, we get 1 over 6. Here, um, Taking the square root of 36 again um, is 6, and uh, here we have square root of 2, or 2 to the power of 1 over 2, which is the same as writing this one here. So in that case, um, the probability amplitude would be that one. The same for the square root of 3 um, over 6, and so on. So and we again see the highest probability amplitude here with square root of 6 over 6. And uh, our space um, here, the dice space, is 11-dimensional. So usually the components are composed of functions, um, which can be used as components of state vectors as long as these are linearly independent, meaning independent axes in Hilbert space. It's Hilbert space by the way, is the complex vector space that we're using for expressing the amplitudes, so the probabilities, probability amplitudes of quantum states. A set of vectors, phi sub n, is linearly independent in Hilbert space if all coefficients a sub i equal zero, and none can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. And here on the left-hand side, we see some examples uh, for the functions. Okay, since we're moving in 11-dimensional 
um, dice space, uh, we go down to 11 here with the exponent. The, uh, we remember already um, what we talked before, we talked about before that for any cat vector, there is a bra vector. So and if we look at our cat here, so our probability amplitudes, so if we look at that one here, um, then the cat vector, the column vector, is given by the amplitudes here. So you'll find 11 amplitudes here. Um, and of course, these must so score it some to unity again, because then we're dealing with probabilities. Um, and then you look at the bra vector here on the bottom. It's given um, by this one. Since we don't have any complex numbers in here, um, you don't see any change. Uh, but usually, if you have complex numbers, as we remember, we're dealing with the complex conjugate. OK. And here is just another reminder that the bra vector equals um, complex conjugate transpose of the ket. Okay. <clears throat> Imagine the description of states via space vectors in three-dimensional Hilbert space. So an x, y, and z, as we had before, are the basis and position space. And most likely, not all calculations can be done in position space. So let's assume we want to represent these states in momentum space. And any position vector must be converted into a momentum vector. And any component must be rewritten. Any component must be pursued in detail during calculation. And now what we use is symbolic calculation or in symbolic um, notation, which is the bra cat notation. So as we saw before by um, looking at the identity matrix here, so I find it a lot easier um, to do a computation with bra cat notation or in bra cat notation instead of doing the whole matrix calculation. So for this simple transformation, it may not look like it, but if the transformations become more complicated over time, you'll see that it's um, a lot more cumbersome to do the matrix uh, notation. And especially if we have to do um, transformations in space, which we don't need to do in quantum computing, but it's a general thing in quantum physics. So therefore, the bracket notation, so it was not um, invented for doing quantum computing, but it also makes quantum computing easier or trying out transformations. <clears throat> OK, so this just summarizes this again. If there is a requirement to deal with the cat components, so meaning a physical answer is required, the components can be used in any basis by transferring them into the basis axes. So for example, um, what we saw before, i, j, and k is position space. And we want to find the components of psi along i, j, and k for getting the new formulation of phi. Then phi sub i are the unit vector of the desired basis, which you can see here. OK. Some more properties um, in the Dirac notation. So uh, the square of the absolute product of two state vectors is smaller or equal, so these ones here, is smaller or equal than this one here. It's called Schwartz inequality, and it's important for the uncertainty relation. So two cats are orthogonal. Uh, we had that before already. If the inner product of them is zero, um, they are orthonormal. Um, we also had that before. Um, if you look at psi and phi again, if uh, you do the inner product between psi and phi, we have zero. If we do it with uh, psi and itself, it's one. And if we do it with phi and itself, it's also one. Just to give you some uh, examples of other operators in quantum physics, um, and we don't need them for doing quantum computing, um, so, but I, would, I still want to show you so that you have an intuition as to what's going on. So in quantum physics, measurement parameters are represented 
in the form of operators. And uh, that's also what we do in quantum computing. And an operator applied on a wave function creates a new wave function. Remember, um, just before, when we apply transformation to a state, it gives us a new state. So a simple example, um, d over dx applied on a wave function psi of x creates a new function, a derivation according to the position, the derivative in that case. Yeah? The impulse um, in classical physics passes over to the impulse operator. There's a way to um, derive it and, and get to that here, which we won't do right now, but um, passes over to the impulse operator in quantum mechanics. So with IH bar um, and del, um, where H bar is the reduced Planck's constant. So um, in older notations, you have the Planck's constant H um, over 2 pi equals H bar, which is generally, I find, bad practice. So we just call H bar Planck's constant because that's the one that appears very often in all the equations of quantum physics. The operator for kinetic energy um, classically is p squared over 2m. So p squared, so you remember, um, the momentum is given by mv squared. Um, so in that case, uh, the result uh, with the changes are to h bar squared over 2m. And the Hamiltonian operator, um, so is different for every physical situation, describes the overall energy of a quantum mechanical system. So H applied on a ket results in the energy of a particle described by that ket. And E, the energy, is a scalar. So what that says here, um, that's the Schrodinger equation, it says the Hamiltonian of a wave function um, is the energy of a wave function. So the energy is a scalar and the Hamiltonian, uh, it contains the kinetic and potential energy. Okay. Um, another one is the unity operator, which we already got to know before, which leaves the ket unchanged. So I applied to psi of r equals psi of r. Um, now, minus h bar squared over 2m delta describes the kinetic energy of a particle. Um, so here uh, we see that uh, on the bottom here, this operator delta, um, here in that case applied to a wave function, is the second derivative to the respective position coordinates, so along all three axes if we're dealing with a particle moving in 3D space, okay? So a second derivative of x, y, and z um, applied to the wave function. Uh, v of r in the presence of an outer potential describes the potential energy and if there are more particles, the interaction between these. So in that case, the Schrodinger equation um, if you heard about that one before, can be re-expressed as um, h um, of psi of r equals minus h bar squared over 2m um, delta psi of r plus v of r psi of r equals the energy, uh, so e psi of r. So in that case, <clears throat> here we see the potential energy, here we see the kinetic energy. And we have the Laplace operator already. So which you will also sometimes hear as this one del squared. Or del in case if you only do um, the first derivative. Some other operators are the gradient, um, which is del uh, in that case. Um, so here we have the first derivative, um, d of psi or the x, um, so here on that position, here on towards y and dz. And uh, here we have our original uh, vectors that we talked about before already. So we have the impulse operator, p, um, 
we have the Laplace operator, um, gradient of second order, used for the creation of the Hamiltonian operator, which you already had before. And uh, operators in general do not commute. So if you look at that one, AB does not equal BA if you have two operators. So which in simple terms just means the sequence uh, matters. So you cannot apply them in arbitrary sequence. Um, if you apply A before B or B before A, it makes a difference, a significant difference. An operator is linear. Um, if, uh, so if you look at that example, so the operator A applied to that state, uh, I think we had a very similar example before already, um, is the same as um, operating, taking that operator and applying it to um, this first state and then the second one here. Um, so if we think about the identity, um, that makes sense again, okay? Uh, so no other news on that. Um, the A dagger is Hermitian and a joint to A, so Hermitian conjugate and a joint. And um, so we talked about how you get that already um, before you have to take the uh, complex conjugates, so meaning the change of sign for all the complex numbers, and uh, replace the cats by the respective bras uh, and vice versa. And uh, if that equals um, the original operator, so A dagger equals A, then the operator is Hermitian. Okay? Which is a requirement for operators in quantum physics, in quantum computing. And um, here, if we look at that one, so this is something you can try by yourself. If we um, have uh, bra psi and uh, ket phi here, and we have the a dagger uh, in the middle, and uh, you exchange these ones, and uh, you do instead of bra psi, you do bra phi, and uh, here bra uh, ket psi, um, and have the original operator in the middle, then the result here must be the same, which makes sense, okay? So now let's briefly talk about uh, the expectation value. Um, the expectation value of an operator is the mean that would be measured in numerous measurements. So the expectation value um, of H, or Hamiltonian, is the mean energy of a system under the consideration, or is the weighted mean of probabilities that a system is in different possible states and can be expressed as a quadratic matrix, um, as is defined um, we saw that one before, and um, here psi is a row, and uh, so bra psi is a row vector, and ket phi, the column vector again, so no news on that side here. So if we look uh, again at the dice example, so the dice operator that we had before, then E is a sum of terms, whereby any term is a number that can be diced, multiplied by the probabilities that this number is shown. Bra and ket process these probabilities, so the dice operator W must store the numbers. If we look at that operator here, so on the diagonal you see um, the possible values that you can get by throwing the dice. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, with everything off diagonal being 0. Now, if we take that one um, with... Uh, the example that we had before, so we do it exactly the same way. So we take our probability amplitudes, we take the complex conjugate, transpose, so in that case we don't have complex numbers, so we just take the column vector, um, other row vector, so we take the row vector, um, take our dice operator, so multiply our row vector with the dice operator, and then we take the column vector of psi, multiply that. And uh, Voila, the expectation value in that case is 7. So now uh, we can see where the terms bra and ket come from. They bracket an operator to give the expectation values. It's pretty cool. So when calculating E, bra, and uh, ket bracket W. So 
our operator. <coughs> so the expectation value needs to be calculated very often. Why it is also written as uh, W here with um, these brackets, which just refers to it's an average. There are some additional rules that I won't read out uh, here uh, that you can remember. Um, they're very simple. Uh, so in, in case uh, you're doing the exam, then please feel free, of course, to bring um, these formulae or these rules. So you can, by the way, it's an open book exam. You can bring all the lecture slides that you want to bring and um, refer to that. So I always find that more natural than having to know everything by heart because at least for me that's not how uh, I work in real life um, so it's very rare that people remember everything they have ever heard but it's more common um, that people look up things for the Hermitian operator so remember for any Hermitian operator a one can choose an orthogonal basis for the entire d-dimensional space whose members are eigenvectors of A. The basis is unique if and only if all the eigenvalues of A are distinct. In the contrary case, A is the generate. Uh, one can pick arbitrary orthogonal basis within each of the subspaces spanned by eigenvectors of A with the same eigenvalue. So if B is a linear operator, then one way to express an operator A sub 1 is B plus um, complex conjugate transpose of B, so B dagger, and uh, A2 possible operator could be I times B dagger minus B in that case. So they're both Hermitian and commute if um, B, B dagger, equals zero so remember if they commute it is zero and um, since joint eigenvector of a sub 1 and a sub 2 is also a joint eigenvector of b equals a sub 1 plus i a sub 2 and b dagger equals a sub 1 minus i a sub 2 so if b then commutes with b dagger one can choose an orthogonal basis of eigenvectors of b specifically since any unitary transformation of U satisfies um, this relation here, or this outcome here. One can choose an orthogonal um, basis consisting of eigenvectors of U, which we already saw before, right? Um, since all U preserve the magnitudes of vectors, its eigenvalues must be complex numbers of modulus 1, called phase factors in quantum theory. Here is more on Hermitian operators, and I encourage you to read through that. I will skip it for now. Uh, we already talked about the inner product, so I think that's already clear, and we don't need to go into more detail with that. <coughs> so I will skip that one too. We also already talked about the outer product. Um, the outer product um, in Dirac notation, the outer product of two vectors, phi and psi, so with a linear operator um, where you have bra phi, uh, ket phi, and bra psi here, taking any vector gamma into um, ket phi multiplied by the inner product of bra psi ket gamma. Okay? So the example that we have here um, is very similar to the one that we had before. Remember the identity matrix. I'll pull that up again quickly where you had um, this one here and executed that on the state. Um, then we look at the projection operator. So if you have um, a bra and a cat, or take the cat of um, a bra, so itself, um, then uh, you can create the projection operator onto the one-dimensional subspace spanned by the unit vector. So in that case, we have uh, cat psi 
So for example, any vector cat gamma can be written as the sum of vector uh, cat gamma in the one dimensional subspace and an orthogonal vector uh, perpendicular to the one dimensional subspace. So how we create this, so if we look at one specific example, I take the state zero again. Then what you will get is this operator, which projects onto that state. Okay. And for all possible state, um, as we saw before, when we created the identity matrix, it is the unit operator one, which is the identity matrix. And um, yeah, we learned before why the identity is very important. So sometimes when we execute a transformation on multiple qubits, so on a multiple qubit state, then not always we want to manipulate all the qubits we only want to target specific qubits. So therefore, we must leave some other qubits alone, and that's the ones that we apply the identity transformation to. There is more on identity, which I will skip over. Um, so again, when thinking of vectors in terms of their components in a specific basis, the cat vector Ket psi with the expansion and amplitudes a sub x in the orthogonal basis can be represented by column vector. So we have our probabilities here. Remember, if we um, just look at a very simple state again, the one that we used before, the superposition state of 0 and 1, then in terms of um, vectorial representation, what we will see is the notation it looks like this so it's exactly the same and in that case the associated bra vector since we don't have complex numbers here uh, we just take that one here and make a transpose and have the associated bra row vector all right the outer product, as we have seen before, is a matrix product, um, which asserts this equality here. We mentioned that before already. So the commutators are very important to always check if you switch the sequence of operators. If they commute, uh, the difference um, if you look at that one, so if a, b is not equal to b, a, so if you execute that one, then the difference is called the commutator. And two operators commutate if their commutator equals zero. And in that case, as we said uh, quite some times already, um, the application sequence doesn't matter. So the order of application doesn't matter. Every operator commutes with itself, of course. Some more theory um, to the commutators and anti-Hermitian operators. And um, that's it for today. So thanks for listening in. And um, these were the fundamentals um, in linear algebra and vector spaces that we needed to proceed further in order to define quantum algorithms, which we'll start talking about next time. Thank you very much.